we're back and we're moving into the final portion of our show. We are most excited to talk about some of the latest research coming out of the University of Belize, even before they present it to the rest of the public. So that makes <laughs> us uh, even happier. So the Belize National Research Conference uh, starts tomorrow, uh, and it's going to be held in Belmopan, and they're going to be presenting uh, new research from their faculty. And so we have a number of representatives here to tell us some of the information about their research. We have with us Dr. Christopher DeShield, who is the assistant assistant professor uh, for faculty of education and arts on the end we have Gerardo Polanco who is a lecturer at Sacred Heart College we have Ivory Kelly who is a lecturer at the for, at the University of Belize in the faculty of education and arts and we have Dr. Priscilla Lopez who is the assistant professor of, in the faculty of education and arts at UB and Osvaldo Canton who is a student at UB Good morning Good and morning. welcome. Good thank you. Well, thank you for being here. No, if I could start off um, by repeating what I said, which is that I'm, I'm very proud um, and happy that you guys are here because I'm a UWE student and at UWE there's a lot of research going on and um, a lot of the lecturers who actually wrote the books were the people teaching. And so this is a major step forward. I know that you've told me that there's other research going on and there's a multitude of research. So even from that standpoint, it's a good jettison point to let Belizeans know that our national universities and our educational institutions are producing knowledge that's specific to Belize and relevant to Belize. Mm -hmm. Now, my first question is, what inspired the individual research um, pieces that you've done? Because there are three, as I understand. Yeah. Here, yeah. Yeah. Three here, here we have three, three represented. Yeah. Uh, what inspired each one? And maybe give us a very deep, uh, a very, a brief description of what your research abstract is. Sure. Um, shall I start? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, for our uh, paper, so I am engaged in a collaborative project for this conference um, with Mr. Polanco from Sacred Heart. Hi. And um, we actually, I met um, um, Mr. Palanco at a conference earlier last year that um, our department actually hosted called the Caribbean Studies Forum. And so that um, event occasioned several papers, some wonderful papers. I think Mr. Palanco is among them. And so I got to hear some of the research that he had done at UA, I think, um, mm -hmm. incidentally, right? You're yeah. a graduate from UA, uh, from his thesis there. And I was presenting a paper at the conference, and it just so happened that some of the research that he was doing there meshed with my own interests. Um, I think we're both in literary studies and eco-criticism, and so it was nice to see a kind of kindred spirit in yeah. terms of <laughs> academia. Somebody who talks you about know, a narrow, <laughs> Yes, and a narrow <laughs> discipline. You don't often see those kinds of um, things and connections. Um, so it's at that conference that um, uh, I've learned about his research and his work, and when this conference from Niche, this um, Research for National Development conference came about and they have a call for papers. Um, this allowed us to uh, pursue another research project and uh, on this occasion I asked him if he would be interested in collaborating because his paper contributed uh, a large part to the background for my own approach to a specific text. So I was looking at um, a work of Belizean literature, uh, Ziedjo's Festival of San Joaquin. And so I was interested to see how we could collaborate to delve into that text a little bit more. So what is the premise oh, of, the, of the research? Well, we were so looking I think at... The thesis statement is what you call it? Mm, yeah, well, we were looking at uh, folklore, <laughs> the folkloric element uh, in this book. It, the book has been written on uh, in the critical literature, in the published literature, yeah. although there isn't too much attention given to it. It's like the middle um, child. <coughs> mm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so we wanted to make a, a contribution to that literature, and through this conference, this becomes an avenue to get some feedback from other uh, intelligent people and other people interested in similar subjects uh, so that we can use that criticism to develop the argument and eventually publish in an outlet you know, abroad. In a when you say set. delve into the book, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. what, what are you essentially looking for? Well, uh, for this paper in particular, I noted that Although there were some approaches to the, to the work that were published, 
none of them really engage with the aspect of folklore, Belizean folklore. In particular, we're looking at um, her use of the Ishtabai in Belizean folklore and its cognates, La Susia, La Llorona, those kind of things, uh, which I thought was strange since it seemed to be um, a central part of the, of yeah. the text. Subtle, complex, but uh, it's still a, a, a significant part. Yeah. So that's, that would be our contribution. Yeah. Um, what happened was that when we um, look at folklore in Belize, we're usually getting stories that we get from our grandparents, and yeah. so they're passed on, and, and, and they, they, they don't differ much. But when they're presented in, in stuff like literature, it is the artist's job to use those as a sort of lens to see ourselves or, or as a mirror. Yeah. For example, if we see like um, La Llorona, th th this is the, a woman who killed her children because of an abusive man. And these stories existed in a time where we did, had very little understanding of postpartum depression. And so because of that, then this woman who is suffering from a very real uh, mental illness is demonized. And because of that, um, and these have um, very real world applications in Belize, f especially with women who are um, fighting against um, everything that is set up against them in society, they, are become, they have become demonized. So. Um, as an artist, it is their responsibility to um, to safeguard the cultures that we're doing, but the culture must also safeguard marginalized people in an, in an already marginalized population. So that is how we're seeing these folklores, that they can tell us more about who we are and where our ethical reasoning comes from. You, you, you have taken a very cheeky approach to this book, though. Basically, as I understand <laughs> it, from the abstract, you're saying, listen, Belizeans, you take this thing like story tales, mm -hmm. but it is far more important than yeah, that. Yeah. And you guys overlook, you guys like Bekalam, and mm -hmm. you guys are championing Bekalam, but this is where the money is at, this is where the bacon is at. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you deconstruct the book in such a way, are you concerned of any sort of um, misunderstanding of, of what you're trying to push in dissecting it? Because taking it more than just, it's like taking Animal Farm and saying, this is not just about some pigs, you know, guys. Mm -hmm. This is really, really about some amazing <laughs> stuff going on here. Yeah. And getting Belizeans to love the depth, the intellectual mm -hmm. depth coming out of this book must be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you bridge that gap? Well, um, I know there's some people, it's maybe phrased kind of negatively, but there's some <laughs> people who believe that every act of interpretation is a, is a misreading, right? So you can't read it absolutely, um, but you have strong misreadings, right? Uh, better than weaker ones. So you try, you attempt the strongest misreading of the text, <laughs> right? Uh, which I kind of like, I like that, uh, that rubric. There's always more to learn when you're reading a text and you're just trying to get the strongest misreading, right, um, of that work, right? Yeah. All right, let's move on to Ms. Kelly. Yes, so they mentioned uh, the role of the artist, and mm -hmm. it just so happens that I am one of the artists. Um, and my main um, project um, and that I'm going to be presenting on at the conference is a creative writing project. I, um, I have translated into Creole using the standardized Belize Creole spelling system, a short story that I originally wrote in English. And so my main objectives include the case that um, given the fact that we've had the Creole Dictionary since 2007, it is high time that we produce a far more robust body of Creole literature than we have today, yeah. right? And also to, um, to also make the case that in order for that to happen, um, to return to the arguments put forward by the, our esteemed linguists as far back as maybe 1995 or 1973 when Calville Young wrote his dissertation, the argument for the elevation of Creole to an official status. Um, with Creole being an official language, we will be teaching it in school. It will be policy driven and it will be alongside English, one of the languages that we teach in school. And then we all will be able to, to read and write Creole as competently as we do English. Um, I think it is very unfortunate that my reading level in Creole, Creole is my first language, mm -hmm. uh, my reading level in Creole, I would assess it at maybe around a standard 
ones than a two reading and wow. writing level yeah. and that is unacceptable and so um, at the University of Belize we have begun to have these kinds of conversation in our literature courses to um, incorporate more Belizean literature mm -hmm. in our, our in our in academia and including now Creole literature right and so I want to show by using the translation project that I have undertaken that this is possible that it is necessary yeah. and it's high time that we do it can I ask That's this question which is sorry um, there's a disconnect for me um, in terms of and I'm asking you to kindly address it for sure. me wipe it out my head quickly if I can <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this con there's this perception that Creole is a spoken language it, it's not um, it doesn't have its origin in a written form. So to say that your, your proficiency in reading and writing mm -hmm. it is, a, is at a standard one level, it's probably because that's the level of the highest graduation of where it is. Yes. Um, is it that we're trying to move Creole past what its natural weight is yes. into an area that it's probably unnatural to? At this point, it is still, by and large, an oral language. Mm -hmm. But with the availability of the lexicon, we now have the tools to elevate it to the status of English, where we can read it, we can write it, we know what the rules are. There are there's a, an increasing number of publications on the grammar of the Creole language. Yeah. There's a publication by Ken Decker. Um, that outlines the, the Creole grammar and then the dictionary tells yeah. you what's the standardized spelling. Yes. And so we have the tools available now and so you know we can and should um, produce more written forms of the language. I like to talk it's to scientists. fascinating <laughs> because, because I've always questioned, I, I recall, you know, especially when I first came uh, to Channel 5 that the Belize Creole Dictionary was a standard in the newsroom because there is a standard mm -hmm. in terms of spelling yes. for Creole no. um, and how you translate English into Creole or vice versa. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be a lack of uptake to take it seriously. Um, for some reason, people feel that maybe because it is oral, I can spell it the mm -hmm. way I choose. Mm -hmm. um, and even there's a differentiation between what someone in the North city mm -hmm. or south may use mm -hmm. interchangeably. Mm -hmm. I always use the reference that you know someone is from the south when, see, when they say she mm -hmm. um, versus e, mm -hmm. which we use here. Yeah. How do you fit that into the conversation in talking about formalizing the language? Very good, very important question. We're talking about re perhaps regional variations. Yes. And it is true that um, the Creole has a different set or some unique features. Yeah. The way it's spoken in Toledo, for example, or Punta Gorda, say, versus Belize City, versus, I was even told by one of my colleagues yesterday that people in Roaring Creek speak Creole in a very distinctive way, different wow. from how you would hear Creole in Belmopan. So there are regional variations, and that's one of the research questions that I am proposing in my presentation on Thursday um, to invite our linguists and other scholars to do the research in order to help us determine what are the different uh, regional variations of Creole um, and which ones then one of my main concerns in this project is to determine which variety is most suitable or lends itself most readily to um, literary publications contemporary literary publications because we cannot write a contemporary literary work of fiction for example the way we would write a folk tale mm -hmm. right different genre different purpose um, and so which of the varieties lends itself most readily mm -hmm. All right, I have more questions for both of you, but I want to hear about uh, the third. This is why you need to go to the research conference or find out how you can participate. Um, so the final piece that we're, we're just briefly scratching the surface on is a very critical issue in this country. And that's talking about mathematics mm -hmm. and how we learn or don't learn. <laughs> Please tell us more. Um, I ordinarily research in mathematics. It's my major area. And I also teach a research course at the University of Belize. And Mr. Canton is one of was one of my students, and he um, was pursuing a research on math anxiety and math efficacy. And and he was examining 
And if persons believe that they cannot solve math problems, will that impact their performance? And if they're very anxious, they're panicky, when there's a test, perhaps they, they, you know, they're trembling, they're not focusing, how does that impact performance? And so given my background in math ed, I guess I, my dissertation is on the use of constructivist-based instruction to teach math problems. Um, Do you speak I in English? Pardon? Constructivist. <laughs> constructivist <laughs> Um, yeah. Use of constructivist based instruction. Layman terms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's like having, okay, it, it's having students engage in learning activities to reflect on word problems with their peers and speak about what it, it is about. Can they actually do that? Sounds much better in the fancy way you put it, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've also been trending the results of the PSC in mathematics and at the secondary level. And I'm very concerned that the, the scores don't seem to improve any. Um, and so when Osvaldo began researching about efficacy and, and beliefs and, and, and anxiety, I found that to be very exciting. And so we've both um, began to look at his data and we're about to publish in a journal um, our findings. And But I want Osvaldo to share, but we must um, say that we've noted that many of our students are very anxious. They get very... Um, almost scared of mathematics yeah. and they, they, they believe that they cannot perform well and if you're doing something and you feel I can't do this well and I don't feel like I can perform well doing this it mm -hmm. really impacts how they feel about the subject mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and so it's a really um, huge area that we're exploring looking at the students and how they feel about the subject itself mm. yeah well I would like to say that um, it is more common than we think of math and math and is very common. I mean, uh, all the time when I get into groups and I talk to, to, to my colleagues, the first thing they say that, oh, you're really going to talk about mathematics, just, just not get into that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and Especially to this group over here, you know, there's a brain battle happening. <laughs> so, and the thing is that since I am planning to be a teacher, yes. I always see mathematics in different ways. I try to, to, to see mathematics in, 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 in different activities. How can we make ma mathematics more engaging? So that's a very interesting thing because I was looking at the, at the PSE results and, and indeed out of a, a trend of 10 years, they have, not, uh, in have no increase whatsoever, just uh, like a 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 50, stays on the 50s. So it's, it's, it's really a concern. So I, I must admit that there must be like many factors uh, influencing that, but then math anxiety is clearly one. And um, we look at, for example, we put in, in Google, we put um, um, any kind of anxiety, like science anxiety, and then you would not necessarily see that much information. There. So if you put math anxiety now, a vast amount of information. I mean, mm -hmm. as a country, we need to delve it a little bit more in that because many research have been carried out in, in, in other countries relating to math anxiety. It's a serious, serious issue. How did you make the connection between math and uh, which you've just probably explained to half of Belize what problem they have in a scientific way, but how did you mm -hmm. make the connection between math and anxiety and not between math and anything else? Okay. Why math anxiety? Well, I think it, it, it touches um, in the sense of the personal experience, right? Um, um, the thing is that I notice that I get into the class, right? I'm good at mathematics. I, I consider myself good at mathematics. And, um, but when I get into the class and, and the teacher is just giving the test and, and, and they're always telling you, oh, you have 15 more minutes to go. So this thing rushes into my mind, you know, the adrenaline kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just freeze and I forget what yeah. to put in the answer. Yeah. And then I yeah. get out of the test and I realize, oh my goodness, that's yeah. an easy problem for me, right? Yeah. So I, I started delving and studying into these kind of things and I re um, realized and I found out that many research, especially for example, that of Ashraf and, and, and he, w he was one of the um, study um, researchers that was actually taking this very seriously. And then he realized that our working memory stops when we have math anxiety. Mm -hmm. And um, there was an, uh, an investigation actually I, I, I'm just trying to wonder, uh, you know, are you talking about people with generalized anxiety who experience it during math or people who only have anxiety for math? It is, and, and that's a good question because we were trying to, to find if there is a distinction between anxiety and math anxiety and many research are putting, up, putting into the table that actually math anxiety is totally different than anxiety. Um, so um, you may get it only specifically ex under the pressure of math executing math. something Numeric, Rega art. yeah, numeric. Relating to relating to mathematics, and I was surprised that some people are actually like get this anxiety feeling just in seeing the book, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and then, no, for real. Yeah. I, I was, I and was, you dismiss it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm guilty. I see it all the time on the show. You know, somebody tries to pressure me with mental math, and I'm like, I can't, just don't, you know? Um, but I'm, you, you triggered a thought in my head, and if you'd allow me, we spoke to a neurosurgeon last week. Um, it was about the science of happy, something completely unrelated. But he was talking about how our brains function differently as individuals. Mm -hmm. And so he used one specific example, and it related to a math test for his son, where his son essentially failed a test because he did not, as we know in classroom, put the work. He never showed the work. Mm -hmm. um, but that his son's brain doesn't work that way. His son's brain didn't work in that particular pattern where you have to put out the full sequence to get to the answer. And I'm thinking of that, and it was triggered by you saying, for 10 years, we've had the same results for math, which is mm -hmm. below average and definitely a critical area. But we're still teaching the same way. Exactly. So those things are, are, are worth considering. I mean, why are we e even, it, it's, it's, it's the thing, and the first thing to look at probably when we see these kind of problems is the teachers, right? Uh, and, and which is not necessarily just the teachers because I believe it's, it's, it's a community because I get into the class now we have a, a very difficult task I believe as new teachers because we get into the classroom we come up with these activities we get to learn from the instructors now they're coming with new ideas and we want to implement these new ideas we want to bring about activities and make mathematics because you see mathematics is just typically the, the board um, teacher getting into and writing formulas and us just writing the answers and it is just not that engaging. So we get with them, with these new activities, we get into the classroom, we wanna, we wanna implement these activities, but guess what? The students are not responding to it. And we are not responding positively to it because, because it has been, um, I think it was, we have developed a culture around the fear about mathematics and it has started from elementary mm -hmm. school. I was ask, so yeah. we bring about this activity. I was going this, um, um, yes, um, last week I was <laughs> doing a, a lesson and then I, I was trying to do these activities with triangles and engaging students with how to build triangles using strings and all that. But the students, I said, you know what? We're gonna do a game today. We're gonna engage in a game in order for you to learn the concept. And the student, the first thing they said, sir, is the game gonna be related to mathematics? <laughs> and I said, of course <laughs> the game is gonna be mathematics. mathematics then we don't wanna play. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly <laughs> what they thought. Then we don't wanna play. And they shut themselves up and they don't give the opportunity. Ah. Uh, yeah. uh. Is there, is there a lie that we have been telling students and the public in relation to mathematics? And is that coming to haunt us in this anxiety? For example, at the primary school level, we say that multiplication three times two is six. And it's a shortcut that it becomes a memorization process as opposed to a representation process. Mm -hmm. I say this, and if you'll allow me just to jump in here, I had a math teacher at SJC, one of the best math teachers, I say, bar none, Fadri Bahar. And before we did CXC mathematics, we had a very long syllabus, as you remember, at CXC. Mm -hmm. And for the first semester at SJC, he taught us none of the syllabus. Mm -hmm. He simply taught us puzzles as to how to solve um, different arcs and different angles. But by the time he got into the actual teaching of math, we just took off. My question is specific to the culture that we have, which is math, unlike any other subject, doesn't give you shortcuts. In English, I'll pit you guys against each other. <laughs> you can read any sentence, you can misinterpret it as you were saying earlier, but you have an introduction to it. You know what a is, you know what the is, and you it's know what- It's definitive. It's definitive. In mathematics, if you don't know what those shivery things mean and how they relate to each other, there's no shortcuts. So my question to you, isn't there a natural anxiety because of the weight and relevance of what mathematics is? We can even tell what light is on mathematics, what life is on mathematics. So are we underplaying the importance of mathematics and shouldn't there be a natural anxiety to it because of that weight? Well, I think, well, I think that um, anxiety to a certain extent is very helpful. Right, yes. uh, uh, and we, we have it naturally. Yeah. I was reading um, 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 about the, 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 the 
the and how it helps us. Yeah. Why to, you get to, anxious yes, and nervous? And, yeah. and the thing is that it helps us in our, our our brain to develop because it develop um, the, the the connections in our brain and it helps us to understand. But to a certain extent, I mean, the anxiety levels we are able to read it based on on, on the forms that we well, when it reaches a certain level, then our working memory just stops. So it's, it's, it's worth questioning. What are we doing? Are we actually, as teachers, as parents, um, making this thing about mathematics a big deal? Are we actually, um, um, why are we saying that, um, for example, in, in, in our parents, we're not giving the opportunity to students to, 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 to learn mathematics in different ways? We are just saying, you have to learn mathematics because it's going to help you eventually. And then what, what do we know about mathematics? That it's just paper, pencil thing. Um, um, we even we say that we, we are we going to use algebra in your real life? <laughs> have, have you heard that question? I don't think that um, that's a very interesting, um, very good question to say, especially because there are many things that we can do in mathematics. Probably because we are not getting used to the activities that we can do. To we we don't relate it to the real life situation, Practical. but in real life yeah. we're always finding the x. Yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, finding the x values <laughs> for this. And <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the first thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, did wh what age did you do the research? Um, oh, age range uh -huh. of students? That was um, junior college students. OK, right. OK. Because it'd be interesting to see how early this ma anxiety develops, because right. sometimes it could be created at a very early age. My question is, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And actually, when you look at, at some of the ways how math is taught in schools, I, it's almost as if though the teacher sometimes would say, this is somewhat challenging. And it's as if though it's an additional level of pressure and stress when that subject is being taught. Yeah. And so I think the way the, the teacher presents it, um, mm. there's need to, to have the students realize this is not as challenging as it seems. And make it fun and exciting. I think that would be helpful. But What about subject teaching from a very young age? Because if you, I mean, you love math. If you're yeah. teaching a preschooler or infant one, I should say, mathematics, you'll approach it differently than someone who has to cover all the subjects and will like one more than the other. Mm -hmm. And isn't math foundational? Like you have to understand mm -hmm. one concept to move forward? Mm -hmm. And there also needs to be an injection of the love for the subject. Mm -hmm. So if you're teaching it because you're intrinsically motivated to teach it, it's your thing, yeah. you're going to you know, inject the students with that passion for, yeah. for the learning. So okay, so math got me, got me tied up for a second, yeah. but I did have a question to come back for both of uh, your, your research. Um, one is, uh, Ms. Kelly, looking at the Creole language, one of the biggest criticisms that we hear, and I know that you're also an English teacher, so you'll understand it even more so. Yes that we as Belizeans struggle to use proper English, whether writing or speaking. Mm -hmm. And all the time, mm -hmm. it is attributed to the fact mm -hmm. that we speak Creole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how does an English teacher see the importance of a formalization of Creole mm -hmm. um, as a help or a hindrance to our English, English skills? Very good. Um, what are the changes that I think we need to make in our education system in Belize as far as how we approach the teaching of language, of the English language um, specifically, is to accept the fact that virtually all of us are acquiring English as a second language. Mm -hmm. I know that when I was in school in our generation, perhaps Chris and I, we were taught, by and large, I think we were taught um, English, we were taught language arts as second language learner. They broke down the components, they taught you the sound, the sound system, the sound um, system, the phonetic system, the spelling and all of that, and then you found ways to integrate it. Um, Approaching the teaching of English as a second language acknowledges our reality. Okay. So um, very excellent and useful research has gone into um, the, the use of Creole knowledge and knowledge of the Creole grammatical structures mm -hmm. in the classroom to aid the teaching of English. And I'm speaking, for example, of the, the dissertation study done by Slovana Odds mm -hmm. in 2012, I believe, in which she carried out this, this, this project where she used Creole and the, well, helped the teachers 
um, to acquire familiarity with Creole and to look at how it contrasts with English and use that knowledge, that contrastive analysis between Creole and English to teach children English. Because if you understand why uh, Belizean English speakers make certain mistakes, right? Yeah. And how that's connected to our, our use of Creole, then you are able to scaffold the students learning of English. And so then to um, value Creole more and use it more in the classroom rather than issue it altogether, I think it's coming against, I, th I think it's high time that we embrace it more and see how it can be used as a tool for the teaching. And, and Dr. Ud's um, study revealed that there is, in her words, dr dramatic um, results, dramatic improvement in the students' English um, grades when that approach was taken. So what we're saying is people, that children enter school and there's an assumption that they know English, but that they have to be taught English as a second language. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but it's, it seems to me that, and, and let me ask you a formal question. What is the, what is the impact of what do you hope to be the impact of your study or what you are provoking thought to? Is it that we use Creole as a, as a tool for the future or is it that we use it as a tool to bolster our learning of English? That, that is one, but also because Creole is our lingua franca. Yeah. Um, in Belize, it is one of the cultural elements yeah. that, that unify us. It is how most of us talk. So it's an important aspect of our identity. Um, if we can embrace Creole and see it for what it is, right? Beautiful, yeah. uniquely Belizean. Embrace that and use it in academia. Use it in the most lofty places. We give it the kind of prestige okay. that English yeah. has. We read in it, we write in it, we use it in all of these settings. We feel better about ourselves. Let me be facey. Yes. <laughs> what, 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 what if somebody were to argue, somebody who's definitely not Belizean, uh -huh. argued that Creole is a thing of the past, not of the future, <laughs> that mathematically, even the number of persons who use it, or population um, <laughs> is a very small percent of a population uh -huh. actually speak English, particularly outside the districts. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, commerce, the future mm -hmm. of Belize in terms of commerce, mm -hmm. if you look at everything other than the fact of what its historical uh -huh. uh, re relevance is, yeah. it has no life beyond. I have to disagree with you on that. No, that's not me. No, that's me. <laughs> that, that, that person, person, <laughs> that person on that. Um, and where, while we do not use Creole, in formal writing situations as much as i hope we will very soon we do use it in every single sphere in the house of representatives mm -hmm. our parliamentarians use it all the time and very effectively <laughs> right <laughs> and and we believe they don't have any difficulty with that we embrace yeah. it um, so, so yes, in Belize, our Creole might be unique to us, and it's only about 350,000 of us who probably know the language, yeah. and if it becomes a written language. Um, but you know what? We, few 350,000 people, are significant. Yes. Who cares, cares what everybody people? else? Who cares what everybody else? But I have else to tell you what I've seen as well. Spanish speakers come into the country, and their first mm -hmm. language is Creole. They do try. They, they don't uh, speak English, they speak Creole. I, I don't want to lose the opportunity to get, get in a question here because talking about um, folklore is something that, you know, we really need to do more often. Um, and, and you mentioned La Llorona <coughs> and how it's been um, formalized in C.H.L.'s book. Now, a lot of times, and this is why I love conversations like that, this is why I love reading research or any new study that comes out, because it just challenges our way of thinking, whether we like it or not, um, and sometimes agree with it or not. But <laughs> when you start talking about a cultural folklore especially, it gets really touchy. Mm. You know, it's almost like, don't go there because <laughs> that's what my grandmother told me and that's what her grandmother told me, and there's a reason because it's going to, you know, if it's uh, keep men from stopping to consume too much alcohol 
or whatever other purpose, or children that they don't wonder about because Tata Duin, they'll get them. How comfortable are you in putting forward a view that may possibly go against somebody's cultural beliefs mm -hmm. and being able to respond to their concerns in that manner? Well, I mean, it's a legacy that the writers are um, working with, right? And I think all the writers, contemporary writers, are confronted with exactly this tradition, this legacy. Um, and they can bravely chart new ground, work yeah. with it. Um, in Ziegel's case, I think she's offering a, um, a recuperation of some of the figures there, especially of the Ishtabai. Um, so that's there. There's also a history be uh, behind some of these figures that sometimes goes unknown by the people using the, the words, the names, and the language. And um, I think my colleague did a good um, job of charting some of the history behind some of these figures that uh, we use, sometimes unknowingly, where it comes from. There's a history? Yes. Where does Tata Duende like, um, come from? Uh, well, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could tell. Most of these um, stories come from indigenous knowledge systems. Um, for example, the Tata Duende, my grandmother told me stories of the Nukushtat which is the same thing as the Tata Duende, only because it has the original Yucatec Maya name. Ah. However, the, the Nukushtat is a guardian of the forest. Of course, they have this sense of dual, dualism. They're both good and evil. But as, if, as all colonized spaces, all native um, knowledge systems have become synchronized mm -hmm. with Christianity. Mm -hmm. And because the, the Nukushtat didn't fit into the spectrum of the Catholicism or Christianity, mm -hmm. then it has become demonized and it is no longer a guardian spirit, but, but, but a trickster and someone who abduct, uh, abducts children. And so all of these um, folklores, they're encoded with, these, with this colonial belief system that in order for us to find out who we truly are, we need to peel back those layers. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, we get a lot of lessons as to how our society tells us how to think and how, what is morally right and what is morally wrong. Can I ask Shubin two questions quickly? Okay. Which is one, um, in, in doing your analysis, the backdrop is Ziegel's book. But were you ever tempted to be get in contact with her and, and have some uh, interaction with her as to what you meant when you did this? Is my perspective interpretation of what you're trying to do here, right? Validate That's your point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing is, um, I hear you guys speaking past the book and past these issues into broader um, topics. What do you envision and hope to be the impact of your research on the landscape of um, writers or, or just yeah, that's a great, those are great questions. Um, the, well, I think Z Ajil herself, um, to address the second of the questions, she, I think, I believe she envisions a social function to her work as well. All of the novels seem to narrate Belizean experience, mm -hmm. and they seem uh, instructional in some um, cases. There's a lot to learn from there, and it seems like she herself would have um, a vision and a hope to influence society, Belizean society in progressive ways. So I hope that um, our own research here would mirror that same function in calling to attention some good. of the things that good. the Edgel has good. In, in the work <laughs> itself, right? So it's complementary in that um, we're calling yeah. attention to things that sometimes get overlooked. Yeah, and, and you're clearly saying that this is a, a missed gem in yeah. our arsenal. Yeah, in the critical Okay, we are, we're running the risk now of turning this into a <laughs> research conference. <laughs> and we are so out of time. But this is fascinating yes. information. And I don't want to miss the point, um, which we didn't ask. But I'm, I'll just go ahead and assume that you put a lot of work into this. And we appreciate it. Yes. And we appreciate you coming here to just give us the very surface level uh, information on, on what you've been working on. Best of luck at the conference, and we really hope to have you back to discuss more. Sure. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. We're going to yes. go ahead and take a final break, and when we come back, we'll have our wrap-up session.